Wow, welcome Anchor Church Online. We're so glad that you're joining us today. <laughs> what a year this week has been. I tell you, we crammed a lot in seven days. But nonetheless, we'll continue to praise God. And we're glad you've joined us here. Uh, it's my heart that each campus would be praying prayers of healing for our nation, of pointing back to God, of repentance, Second Chronicles kind of prayers in chapter 7, verse 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, seek my face and pray, then will I hear from my Father in heaven. I'll forgive their sin and heal their land. Remember, blessed are the peacemakers this week. We're starting a brand new series. It is called Finding Meaning in the Seasons of Life. We're going to be looking at the historic book of Ecclesiastes, an amazing book that sees vanity in the world and value in God. I'm so glad you joined us. Please take time right now. Reach out to us. Send us a little message, a prayer request that you might have. I know there are some families suffering from sickness during this season, others that have suffered from loss. Just be mindful of those folks and lift people up in prayer. Ask for God's comfort and His healing to take place in their lives. Well, I hope your hearts are ready to worship God today. If you've got kids in the family, we've got an amazing resource on our YouTube channel that we'd love for you to pick up and follow along. It's also on our Facebook pages. You can find those there, and they're fun. They're, ex they're exciting. They're a blast to do with your family. So take time to do it. Check it out, and have a great Sunday. Thanks for joining us.
that's gone on this past year and even in the beginning of this new year. Isn't it great that our faith is secure in Jesus, that he is our cornerstone? So let's sing that song, Cornerstone, now, worshiping Jesus, trusting in him that he keeps us secure. Dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless stand before the foe. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong. Savior's love through the storm. He is Lord.
morning, Anchor Church. As we turn our attention from worship to the Word this morning, let's take a look at this video about the meaning of life. Hey, good morning, Anchor family. So glad to be with you today. So excited to, just like Pastor Jared said earlier today, to, to start this brand new series looking at the, the times and the seasons of life. Uh, you know, right now, uh, most people are going through the same kind of question. Every year we ask these new questions about who we're going to be, what the year will look like. As we reflect back on this past year, we start to ask some big questions about life and what's really going on here. I mean, uh, our whole country is in uh, unrest. Uh, so many different things are going on in the world right now. And so we start to ask deeper questions about life. <clears throat> and so that's kind of what spurred us towards uh, going through this series in Ecclesiastes is really trying to find meaning in the seasons of life and in the things that are going on in life with us. Uh, so in order to do that, though, to really find encouragement, to really find the strength that we need from God's Word, to really start to find the meaning in this, uh, I think it's a great thing that we would do is we're really going to need to dig. Uh, it's not going to be a chore for us to do, but we're going to really explore the, the depths of this book of the Bible called Ecclesiastes, and I'm, I'm really excited to go through it. Uh, you know, this book asks a question that many people ask throughout life. Uh, you know, questions, honestly, that, that kind of plague the human spirit. We ask questions, you know, like during this worldwide pandemic, during the societal breakdown and the, the, the stress and unrest that we see, we ask questions like, you know, what's life all about? D does it even matter? Is what's going on here matter for time and for eternity? Do, I mean, even questions like, do I matter? You know, there's, these are some deep questions. Is there purpose? Is there meaning to living life? Have you ever asked that question? Have you ever thought that to yourself one time or another? I don't mean it as a critique of you doubting God or anything like that, but just really asking the question, does it really matter? Because most people have asked that question, perhaps again, you know, more more than ever during this time of this election and societal unrest and COVID. We ask, does, does it really matter? You know, what's what's going on here in all of this? Uh, you know, I think we've, uh, we've been asking things about this our entire lives. I was, as I was prepping for this message this week, I started to think about something from my, from my childhood. And maybe you guys remember one of these here. I hope you can see it, okay? It's, we used to call them fortune tellers, right? Uh, you know, you'd go up to your friend and you'd have one of these things and there'd be numbers on the outside, maybe colors inside. And they'd say, say a number and they'd go one, two, three, four, and they would play with it, right? And after a couple steps, you'd open it up and inside you'd find whatever that thing was supposed to do. They, they performed a lot of different services. It, was, it might tell you who your crush is, you know, the boy or girl that you really wanted to be with. You might say uh, who you're going to be when you grow up, what your career is. And there's a lot of different things that we see in that, you know. And those are kind of our little way as kids of saying, you know, what's life going to be like? What am I going to be like when I get older? Uh, but once we got older, as we started to mature, we started to ask deeper questions with that. It's not just who am I going to be when I grow up? What am I going to do with my life? But is my life going to matter? Is there going to be purpose behind it? Is there going to be a meaning behind that? And I love that I get to share with you. Of course you matter. The Bible teaches us that we were created on purpose with a purpose that God loves you, that you were created. Uh, I love that I can say with authority and confidence, you know, Isaiah 43, 7 says that you were created by God specifically to worship him, to give him glory. That's what the Bible says about you. Every person who's ever lived this life, walked this earth, has said, do I matter? What's my purpose here? Your purpose is to know God, to worship and to serve him. That's what we're here for. So absolutely you matter. But if we're going to get a really good concept of this, if we're going to understand these questions that kind of plague the human spirit about meaning and stuff like that, we're going to really have to dig in. And the writer today of Ecclesiastes gives us just some great insights. And so we're really going to hammer this point home. This is going to kind of be an introduction for the whole uh, sermon series we're going to do across these next few months of really digging in. And in order to get that true understanding of, of his word there, of what we're looking at, we've got to dig deep today. We're going to dig deep into something that maybe you read before. Uh, so would you get your Bibles handy? We're looking at Ecclesiastes chapter 1. And we're going to dig in 
deep to this today. We're going to try to understand what he's saying here as, as we see uh, this, this great meaning of life and that there is, in fact, meaning, there is purpose, and God has a plan for what he's doing here. So take your Bibles, if you would. We're looking at Ecclesiastes chapter 1, and we're going to look at just verses 1 through 3 today. This is going to be our introduction. Again, this is going to set the stage for everything else we'll look at across this series. So normally, again, if we're in person, I say, if we're ready, say we're ready. So say that with me. We're ready. Uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 1, we're looking at just, again, just verses 1 through 3. And it starts here, saying, The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. What does man gain by his toil, uh, all the toil he does under the sun? That's it. We're going to stop right there. We're going, to, we're going to dig into I know it's a short piece, but I want to stop for just a moment. I want to pray, and then I want to start unpacking the depth of just these few words we've said. So let's pray together. Uh, Heavenly Father, today, as we open up your word, I'm praying that your Holy Spirit is going to guide us into truth. Lord, I pray we're going to see the meaning and the purpose that you have in life, even though at times it may seem futile to us. And as we read Ecclesiastes, Father, I pray that uh, we'd understand what you meant through the writer here. God, I pray that our hearts would understand this word, and not only that we would understand it, that we would take it in and we would begin to live it out and we would do so to your glory. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So uh, as we dig into this, in order to really, again, comprehend what we're talking about here, to really try to get the depth, we've got to really dig into what the writer is saying here. And we want to understand first and foremost who this writer even is. It starts off in here, uh, you know, in verse 1, it's saying the, the words of the preacher. The preacher here is in the word, uh, in Hebrew, is the word koheleth or koheleth. And it means the one who calls together or the one who gathers. Uh, not like we watch a hoarders on TV where they're gathering all this stuff together and keeping it. It's one who gathers, kind of like a shepherd, where he goes and he gathers the flock and brings them in. And then just as a pastor, would, he is the one who delivers a message to the assembly. He's the one who brings it in and says, all right, here, come and hear a word from the Lord. You know, it's, uh, it's interesting that in the Greek, uh, the word Ecclesiastes actually means preacher. It means preacher. It comes from the word ecclesia, which speaks of the church assembly or the congregation, the people of God, and the fellowship of believers. And so Ecclesiastes is the preacher, the one who's teaching the people of God. So just to start that off, we see the book is called The Preacher, written by the one who gathers God's people to hear the word of God. So even at the outset today, as we start about this, let me ask you that question. Are you ready to hear the word of God? Have you, have you prayed beforehand? Did you, did you worship with us as we started the service? Have, has your attention gone to only the things of God for this next little bit of time and not to all the other things that are going throughout the day? Are we ready to hear from God? I, I hope your answer is yes. I hope that we're ready to hear from the preacher. But if you're like me, I want to know who's given me the message. So let's see who is this preacher. Uh, you know, across the past month, we spent a, a full month of December looking at all the prophecies about the coming Messiah. And as we read through those, we were able to explore and see definitively that Jesus Christ absolutely is the Messiah, the Son of God. He was the one who was promised. And today we see just in a, a verse or two who this preacher actually is. We can break it down real easy. We, we look at his biography from, from one short verse. It says he is the son of David, so that immediately narrows it down to like seven or eight guys somewhere in there. Uh, we see he's king of Jerusalem, and actually only one of his sons was the official king of Jerusalem. And so that means, of course, it would be Solomon. So Solomon is the preacher here, this very famous man from the Bible, David's son, anointed by God. He was David's son that he had through Bathsheba, uh, and he's a very famous man. You know, across history, we know a lot about him. We know where he's born in 2 Samuel. We see in 1 Chronicles that he's chosen to be God's king, the next anointed one, and we see him become king over Israel in 2 Kings. We also see across the history a lot of the different things that he actually did. Uh, did you know that he actually wrote not only Ecclesiastes, he also wrote the Song of Solomon. He also wrote Proverbs. He wrote uh, Psalm 72, Psalm 127. He's a very prolific writer. Uh, of just uh, He should be. He's one of the most wise men who ever lived. In fact, he was probably the wisest man who ever lived. We see that come up in uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 1. As he becomes king, God comes to him and says, Solomon, you can ask for anything that you want. And he says, I don't want riches. I, don't want, I want to just know how to lead your people, God. And because of that, God blessed him with not only the wisdom to do that, but wisdom beyond anyone ever, as well as more money than Bill Gates and Elon Musk put together could ever hope to have. This guy was the wealthiest of the wealthiest. Uh, he's famous for uh, making wise decisions when other people couldn't decide them. He's also famous for having 700 wives and 300 concubines. 
Uh, the Bible says that if a man finds a wife, he finds a good thing, and praise God for that. But 700 is a mistake because we see that they start to lead him away from who the true God is. He's got this extensive biography, but he was also God's anointed man, and again, the wisest man to ever live. So this preacher here who's speaking for God, giving the scriptures to us, is a very, very trustworthy voice. That's kind of why we explored it, not just to know who wrote it, but that we can trust the one who wrote it. We discover here in, in Ecclesiastes this great thing that Solomon did. Uh, he, he attempted to fulfill every single human desire that a person could ever have. He set out, chapter 2 starts this, what I call his experiment of trying to see if he could be satisfied in life by having the things of life. And as we read through this book, we'll see that he gives an emphatic, no, they do not satisfy. They are worthless. They lead us to what we're talking about here with the vanity of vanities. His words are trustworthy and wise, and his words to us start off, uh, a key word comes up in verse 2, where he says vanity. Not just vanity, not just two times. He actually says it four times. He says vanity of vanities, vanity of vanities. He repeats it over and over again, and this is what's known as what's called a Hebraism, or a way the Hebrew uh, people would communicate things. It's a way to convey extreme <clears throat> or uttermost vanity. There's no better way to describe it than with this kind of emphasis that he's giving to it. And we see uh, similar things like this happen in the scriptures. We see places where, like, Jesus said, truly, truly, I tell you, or verily, verily. Repetition is always meant to get our attention. This is not a stutter. This is an emphatic. It's not a stutter. It's an emphatic. This is something that says, I think this is so important to tell you <clears throat> that I said it twice. You know, can I just give you a, a little tip here? If you ever see the Bible say, truly, truly, verily, verily, things like that, stop what you're doing and pay attention. Because that's what the writer's trying to do. When they repeat it, they want your attention. This is important. It's emphatic. It's something that better stick to you and with you. This ought to be something that gets in there and sinks inside of us. And so the repetition he gives to us here is meant to give great emphasis to it. By saying it two times, this ought to put the greatest of, of emphasis into it. You know, if I tell my kids to do something for a second time, they're usually in trouble. When he says this, he means it so that we would pay attention and get a clear bit of this. And so his assessment of vanity is to say, vanity of vanity is to say, this is the greatest of vanities. There is nothing more vain than this here. It was very interesting that he would talk about vanity, specifically because of the way all this comes across from about the whole of Scripture, not just in Ecclesiastes, but across the whole of Scripture. We get our English word vanity from the Latin word vanitas, and it means empty or vain. So maybe uh, as you even hear that word, you think of other times you've heard in the Bible uh, where we've seen the word vain. Perhaps you think of the Ten Commandments. You know, Exodus 20, verse 7 says, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Right? We should not take the Lord's name in vain. We should never use it in vanity. It should never be used flippantly. As a matter of fact, Philippians 2.10 tells us that at the very name of Jesus, we ought to bow. Every knee ought to bow down before him because he is so holy and righteous and perfect in every way. He is holy. God's name ought to be never used in any way other than with total respect. The preacher here, though, Koheleth, Solomon, means so much more than that, though. It's not just vain or meaningless or vanity. Look at what, let's look at, the, let's break this down together. Let's look at where this word vanity appears across the scriptures. The word he uses here is the Hebrew word havel. Uh, havel, spelled H-E-B-E-L. We pronounce it havel. Uh, it's often used to communicate something that's useless, useless or without value. The definition of it for us would be like a mist or a vapor or a breath. And that's metaphorically putting the emphasis on something that is fleeting, that's elusive, something that we cannot catch, something we cannot obtain. And it talks about it like a mist, right? Uh, we see examples of that. Come out here as it talks about man in Psalm 144, verse 4, where it says, man is like a havel, a breath, just so quick, just here for an instant and then gone. James uh, chapter 4, verse 14 is actually written in the Greek, so he wouldn't use this word havel, but he says, what is your life? For you are a mist. If they were writing it in Hebrew, it said, for you are a havel. You are a mist that just is here for a little time, and then it vanishes. I give most of you a pretty easy example to think of. If you wear glasses or wear sunglasses, right now when you go out, you also wear a mask. And as you breathe out, what does it do? It fogs up your glasses. The vapor fogs up the glasses. 
And what happens? We, we get so frustrated with it, don't we? We can't see anything, but immediately after we breathe it up and it goes, and then the vapor comes back down and it dissipates. That's the idea. It's there for just a moment. It's not going to last. There's no substance to it. it. It's just something that's just very quickly that it goes away. And his example here knows that the man is not permanent on this earth. We have a very short time, so it's imperative that while we live this short life, we do it with some meaning and with some purpose. But that's, again, not where it stops. It's not just a vapor. It's not just a breath. Vanity is not something that is just temporal like that. When we start to see it used in other places across the scriptures, again, it goes from this, this small thing of vapor and mist to something that is just very, very broad. Uh, for instance, uh, Havel's first word or first use in the Bible comes from Deuteronomy 32, 21. And they say, They have made me jealous with what is not God. They have provoked me to anger with their idols. Did you see the word vanity in there? No, we missed it. The word Havel is in there, though. If, if you had to guess, reading that verse, what do you think, what word would, would fit in there for the word Havel? Which one would be vapor or mist in there? Let me read it to you, and I'll bring Havel in there at the proper time. I'll read it again. It says, They have made me jealous with what is not God. They have provoked me to anger with their Havel. They have provoked me to anger with their vapor? With, with their mist? They provoked me to anger with their meaningless, worthless gods. Uh, an idol that is mute, that cannot speak, that is not a real god, is obviously of no value. So that's what he's putting in there. So he's saying there's absolutely no value in the word havel. It's a vapor, a mist. It also means something of absolutely no value in any way. The picture gets bigger, doesn't it? Let's keep going. As Just looking specifically at examples in Ecclesiastes, like for instance, uh, Chapter 2, verse 1, he starts to say, I set off myself, basically to say, I'm going to go taste and see everything there is in the world to try to satisfy myself. And then he explains it by using the word Havel to say that it accomplishes nothing. When I set out to do all this, it was vanity. It was Havel. It was accomplishing nothing. I wasted my time. It did nothing because it was of no value there. Pursuing the pleasures and the possessions here is fleeting because you cannot take it with you. Most of us have heard that before, right? You cannot take it with you. I remember a few years ago, I remember uh, I saw a guy on uh, some news article or something like that. A very wealthy man had done this kind of publicity thing to bring people together. And he said, here, I'm out here at this graveyard today. And he had stood there and said, I bought these three graveyard plots. And when I die, I'm going to take my favorite, my 57 Chevy, and be buried in it. And I'm going to take all my money that I've got out of the bank. I'm going to put it in the back of the car and be buried with it. And people go on and on. They, they, they're calling them out for months across this social media platform. Called, what are you doing? You're just throwing your money away, saying all the things we think about. You know, you can't take it with you. And at the end of this, about a three-month period, he gets up and he finally says, this was just a publicity stunt to show you how pointless it is to think you can take this with you. And his point was that you would give to his charitable organization at the time. But it emphasizes the point that the things here and now are worthless to us. They cannot, we cannot take them with us. You know, naked we're born, naked we leave. We bring nothing into the world. We'll take nothing with us. There's no value in chasing those things. It accomplishes nothing. It is a vapor. It is a mist. It's something that's so very temporal. It has no value. Ecclesiastes 8.14 just keeps opening it up more and more and more. The teacher says this word here. He says, Havel, <clears throat> as he's speaking about the injustice of righteous people receiving bad things and bad people receiving good things where it doesn't make sense to him. He's not saying there that it's a vapor or it's a mist that they would do that. What he's saying is, it is completely absurd to me that something that should be this way, that those who are doing good are receiving bad and those who are doing bad are receiving good. It doesn't make logical sense. So he's essentially saying it's completely absurd. Vanity is a vapor. It is a mist. It is something that accomplishes nothing. It's something that, uh, that has absolutely no value and it is so meaningless that it is absolutely absurd. It makes no sense. If we add all these up, that's what we see. He says, he says vanity. It means it holds no substance. It has no value. It accomplishes nothing. It presents no tangible benefits. So in every single way, it is utterly useless. There is absolutely no value to this whatsoever. His repetition of it means that it's also not just vanity. It's a vanity of vanities. It is worthless. It's astounding. It's like saying, I can't say enough bad things about this. To the nth degree, this is vanity of vanity. It is so worthless to go after this. Now, maybe you're saying, okay, Carl, we get it. We get it. But what is this vanity? What is this vanity <clears throat> we're specifically talking about? Is it Hollywood? Is it excess? Is it plastic surgery? Is it always doing my hair? 
What is he talking about here? The answer is very simple. We just keep reading here. We just keep reading. He says, vanity of vanities, vanity of vanities, all, say that with me, all, all is vanity. All is vanity. What is, what, what is vain? What's worthless to chase? What has no value? What is absurd? Everything. Everything. Can he mean everything? Yes, he means everything. But we're going to clarify what he means by everything in this. The word he uses for this is the Hebrew word called kol, and it means literally the whole or the totality. All of it. Every single piece of this. Every single piece of this temporal world is of no value. Every single piece, everything under the sun, this side of heaven, is vanity. The works of men, the pursuits of people, worldly investments, time given to things, resources you accumulate as you fill up your storage units and your attics and your spare bedroom and your closets are full of stuff that just bring no value to the eternal things that we look at. Vanity, just, just for clarity, vanity is the pursuit of things in and of this temporal world a world that is coming to destruction. He's saying this. This is the height of foolishness in life would be to invest your life and your efforts into something that is going to burn to the ground. Just like building up a sandcastle right next to where the waves are coming in. It might be there right now. It's going away for sure. The height of foolishness in life would be to invest in the things of the world, to give all your devotions to that, all your heart, and none to the eternal things. It is absolutely absurd, he says, to go after those kind of things. Now, for clarity, just for clarity, I want to make sure we don't miss this. God, these things are not vain in of themselves. God has never made anything on earth vainly or worthlessly. Amen? God has made everything as he designed it to be with purpose. 1 Timothy 4.4 4 tells us everything God created is good. Say that with me. Everything created by God is good. You know, living a God-honoring life, raising a family, uh, investing in helping people are all good things. You know, enjoying the work that God has given you. We looked at that in, I think, chapter 5 of Ecclesiastes. You know, these things are, are good. They're even pleasant to us, very much so. But even enjoying these good things can become vain when they become the end we are seeking after with them. If our life is all about just finding things and possessions and what comes after my heart here and the investments of this world, I have wasted my life. It's vain. We've missed those things. You know, a life focused only on the things of the world is not only sinful and foolish, according to 1 John 2.15, it is utterly absurd to do so. I don't know about you, church. To, to read this this week, to, to dig into these things and start to see a principle that I knew, but now I just, I've got this great depth of absurdity, no value, it doesn't do anything. I've got a better understanding of this, and that spurs me towards thinking about where we go from this. I don't want to get ahead of myself, though. These things are utterly useless. So just, just again, for clarity, everything in this world is vain when compared against the eternal kingdom of God and his eternal purposes. Everything, every pursuit in this life that does not involve working for the kingdom of God will eventually fade away and therefore does not have value. It does not mean it cannot be good. It does not mean it cannot be pleasant. It means it does not have an eternal value. And we as eternal people, eternal beings, don't invest in the temporal world. We invest in the kingdom of God. Which logically then, if we know this, if there's nothing to invest in here, we ought to turn our attention to the kingdom of God. Amen? We ought to go straight there. All our focus ought to be there. All our pursuits, all our desires ought to go there. God, help us if we ever said, I'm doing this under the full realization that I'm basically just spinning my wheels. I'm on a treadmill trying to make it to New York from here. It's foolishness. It doesn't do anything. Our attention ought to turn to him and to the eternal things of God, to his eternal purposes, what's going on to save people, to glorify God, to do everything we know the scriptures have called us to do as the people of God. Part of the reason he tells us this is because the things of the world that people chase after are completely insufficient to satisfy us. They will never do it. Church, I, I've not been able to be in Solomon's position to be able to taste and see everything out there, but I tell, I've tasted a lot of different things. In my life before Christ, I've tried a lot of different drugs, very foolishly. I tried a lot of different pleasures of the world. I sought and tried to find that. My testimony, I'd love to share it with you sometime if you got a chance to hear it, but my testimony is I, I was like, the first time I ever heard the Lord speaking to me uh, at my dad's wedding when I was not a Christian yet, I was totally engrossed in drugs and, and living after him, and I watched my family rejoice, and, and they knew Christ, and I saw the joy and the peace and the, the purpose they had there, and that's the moment I heard the Lord speak to me the first time, not audibly, 
Everything, Carl, that you're looking for in the pipe and in the bottle is in me. All these futile things I have been chasing, he tells me, is found in me, and that's the same principle here. Everything we're looking for, church, every heart desire you have that is not after God, it has been skewed. It's a good desire meant to chase God. We have skewed those desires. And this here is a call for us to come back and realign those desires with the right things, to get our hearts and our minds set on the things of God. Because the things of the world cannot satisfy us. C.S. Lewis said one time, if I find in myself desires which nothing in this world can satisfy, the only logical explanation then is that I was made for another world. Jesus said it like this. He said in Luke 12, 15, he said, take care and be on your guard against covetousness. That means letting your heart chase after things you're not supposed to have or, or go after. But against all covetousness. Why? Because one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. If everything is vanity, if everything is life is vanity, if all things are worthless, then it begs the question, what's life all about, doesn't it? We have to say, well, what am I doing here? If all the things I'm doing here don't matter, what am I doing here? You know, what do I get out of all this? And that's kind of what the preacher asks as he walks into verse 3. What does it gain man for all his toil under the sun? What am I getting out of this? If everything I'm doing is not of any value, it's going to burn away, it's going to just disappear, what's the point of doing all this? He's just said that worldly pursuits are futile. What do we get out of it? Why do we labor? Is there even a point? Absolutely, there's a point. Absolutely, there's, there's a call in our life to do these things. They, they, they walk us through. They help us to see God who, for who he is in contrast to other things. They help us to say we've got a specific path to walk as we go through this. But as the preacher's talking about this, he's not talking just about your job because every single one of us might be getting up on, on Monday mornings, you know, thinking, oh, what am I even doing this for? I don't like my job. He's not talking just about your, your work or your labor. He's talking about living in this world. So, of course, it's going to your job, but it's also just living life. It's in your relationships. It's where you put your spare time. It's where you put your resources. It's where you will have your hobbies. All these pieces are built into that. But if all these things are fleeting, what's the point for me? I don't mean it just as, as a kind of a selfish question, but truly, we're looking, you know, if, if I'm doing this and I'm not seeing any result for it right here, right now, what's the point of me even doing these things? You know, I, do I even, it, it walks through this whole cycle of, of value and purpose and, and focus in life. You know, some people take it to the extreme and even ask, does my life even matter at all? They start to become depressed over that as they see that, you know, the things of the world, they don't satisfy. And with, with no hope of heaven, with no one sharing the gospel with them before, or not believing in God, they have no hope to walk into that. I mean, this kind of thing has led to the mindset that our culture is in right now. A culture that says, if you don't want that baby in your tummy, just get rid of it. It's a hassle anyways, isn't it? It says that life doesn't start at conception. It starts when the mother decides it's okay to have the baby. They tell us that we are a cosmic space accident, that some space garbage exploded, collided, and turned in, and because through no purpose whatsoever, we were accidentally made. We came from monkeys. I don't see how they, they don't miss the disconnect that when you tell people that they came from animals and that nothing matters, that they would act like animals and act like nothing matters. That's why we see our world going like this, where we're calling good evil and calling evil good. Church, we just look at our world and we see the, the despair that is out there. We see the hopeless. We see the truth of what we're reading about right here. That even with good intentions sometimes, that the things of the world are not going to last. And so we do not pour our efforts into that. We do not pour our efforts into that. I'm thankful that uh, this is not the end of the book. I'm thankful that he has walked through this, uh, explaining this. And again, this is just kind of the, the precursor to all this. Uh, so while we do look at futility here of the life, that's, I want you to be encouraged that this author has much, much more to say about. This is setting the stage for if it is futile, we're going to talk about why there's what, what matters, what the eternal side of it is, knowing God better. I want you to be encouraged that not only this author, but the whole of Scripture tells us this and reminds us about the value that we have about God's care and about the things that we do for the kingdom of God here absolutely will last. You know, church, not, not only do, do you matter, you matter greatly. You are not a cosmic space accident. You were made by God on purpose with a purpose. God created you with intention. He was intentional about creating you, and he made you for a purpose. And I shared that purpose at the beginning. 
Isaiah 43, 7, my people whom I have created for my glory. You are on this earth right now. You can do a lot of things. God's got some stuff going for you. The primary principle you are here for is to bring glory to the King of Kings. You were no accident. You were created on purpose with a purpose. So can I give you an encouragement here, church, <clears throat> as we walk through tough times here, as we explore futility, that you don't allow your emotions to get the best of you in this, that you wouldn't allow a bad day to say, what's the point? I'm, I don't even want to try anymore. Church, don't give up. Don't, don't be hopeless in this because the things that you are investing in, the eternal things that most of us, we can't even see really going on are the full fruit of that. Those things matter incredibly. You are making an impact on the kingdom of God just by being a child of God who is filled with the Spirit of God. And even as anchored churches, we fellowship together and we are the people of God. We are building up the kingdom of God as we work together in this. When working for the King of Kings, all things matter. Let me say that again. When working for the King of Kings, all things matter. From you giving a glass of water to a small person, like Jesus said, to maybe praying over someone and seeing a miraculous healing happen. God works in all those different ways. Never being limited. All these things that we do, big, small, all matter for the kingdom of God. But pursuing the temporal things of the world is vain. And we know that because we look at it, we can see its true depth of worthlessness as we compare it to the eternal things of God. Jesus wanted to make sure that we didn't miss things like this, you know. He said in John 6, 27, Do not work for the food that perishes, the things of this world, but work for the food that endures <clears throat> for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. Not laboring for the things that are here in this world, but investing in the eternal things. He said it another way in Matthew 6, 19 and 20. He says, Don't store up for yourselves treasure on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store for yourself treasures where? In heaven, in the eternal place, where moths and vermin do not destroy, where thieves don't break in the steel. Why? Because those are eternal things that they last. Church, you know, investing in the eternal things of God here and now looks like spending time with God, honestly. It's, it's investing in obedience to his commands. It's through sharing the gospel. It's through giving money and helping people through resources. It's through leading our families well. It's through being gracious. It's modeling the character of Christ. It's investing in saying, I'm going to go across the street and talk to my neighbor because I see him struggling with this. I want to share with them the eternal things, the things that are going to last. To, to the friend who I've known for years and years who isn't a Christian, who is a shopaholic, I'm going to say there's hope to be had outside of buying stuff. To the drug addict friend, I'm going to say there's hope outside of that drug, that needle, that pipe, that bottle that you're using. There is peace to be had outside of your appearance. You're, you are not built on what you look like, ladies and gentlemen. Your hair can be clean. You should wear a nice shirt. Be pretty. Be handsome. Do those things, but don't base your lifestyle on who you are, on what you look like. Those things are taken away so quickly. We don't invest in that. We invest in the eternal things that will last. When we as a church remind ourselves of this stuff, you know, even just by our, our vision or our mission statement as Anchor Church, we're we are planning churches you know, that love God, that love others, and make disciples who do the same. We are anchoring people to Christ by planning churches that love God, love others, and make disciples who do the same. If you've ever oh, wondered, hey, Anchor Church, why are you doing that? That's why. Why are we doing this outreach this year? Why are we ministering like this? Why are we doing small groups? Why does Carl and Justin and Jared and Jordan and all the guys on our staff, why do so many people serve? Because we're trying to anchor people to Christ. We want them to do that. That's on our mission statement. That's what pours out of us. Jesus gave us the practical command of this in Matthew 6, 33, where he says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then all these other things that we are constantly chasing after, going after, will, will, will be given to you. Not that you will receive them. We will find contentment in what that desire was before. He will focus those desires. We're not going to invest in the things that are going to Go away. We're going to invest in the heat, in, in the eternal kingdom of God as we live here and now. Can you imagine if this is where we stopped? If we had just read verses 1 through 3, it said, Vanity of vanities, it's worthless. And, we, and that was the end of the book. If Ecclesiastes was three verses long, what kind of despair there would be there in us? I mean, imagine uh, going through this. It would be very grim. When we would be distraught over this. We would be heartbroken over this. If this was the word that was there that the Bible says, listen, it just doesn't matter. 
What if that was how we based our worldview? What if that's how we looked at everything in life was through that lens of it doesn't matter? So many people do that. Imagine where you'd be mentally, physically, emotionally. You'd be hopeless. Imagine walking through 2020 with all the struggles and strife that we've seen without Christ. Church, I'll say, I've faced a lot of struggles this past year. I cannot imagine trying to walk through those without Jesus and without Anchor Church around us doing this. Without the support of Christ to walk through these terrible things to have, say that I don't know what's coming in the future. I don't know what's going to happen with our country. I don't know what's going to happen with our world. I don't know what's going to happen with our environment. What I do know is the one who holds the future of all those things. And I can rest in that. And he's told me to invest in eternal things, not temporal things. People face terrible struggle and they have this kind of mentality. It's pointless. It's pointless. The people live out in the world right now. People who, conviction, gentle, loving care, hope of the Holy Spirit. People that we could have invited today to hear this message. People that we could have invited to hear this message sit now lost. Can I encourage you to share this message or share North's or South's or whichever message you get to watch today, that you would share this on your Facebook page or wherever else you get a chance. Share some of this hope because there are people out there right now that are starving for just a reason to carry on. And we know, church, there are so much bigger things than here. And there absolutely is a reason to be coming in there. What amazing hope, what peace, what purpose could we bring to people if we would share that, if we would take their idea of Ecclesiastes 1, 1 through 3 and not stopping it there and keeping going on to say that there are things that matter, that you matter. That Christ's forgiveness is ready to welcome you into the family of God if you would repent of your sin and come to him. And say, Jesus, just make me one of your kids. Please forgive me. Please make me who you want me to be. What an amazing hope we have an opportunity to share. I hope that inspires you to hear that today, church. Not to look at the negative side of it. It's so vain. It's so worthless. It's so absurd. Turn that to the positive side for us as the church. Say, if that's the truth, how much more emphasis should we go? Be saved, be saved, if it was not weird to say that. We should be repeating that. Verily, verily, I say to you, truly, truly, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Please repent. Please come to Christ. Please come to Christ. Some folks, you know, uh, we've kind of reached the end of our time now. I'm so glad we're not done talking about this, but for today, we've kind of reached the end, and, and we, we know now, you know, where we can find meaning in the seasons of life. We know we can find contentment as the church, don't we? We can find them when we have them before us, when we, when we find them in Christ, when our heart, our soul, our mind, our strength, when all of us is going towards Him and focused on Him. That's where we find the contentment in life that we are searching for in those other futile things. Times may seem grim right now. They may seem even meaningless at the time, but let me share this with you. And church, I want you to hear me on this. Nothing could be further from the truth for the Christian. To think things are meaningless, to think that you don't matter, to think life is worthless, nothing could be further from the truth for the Christian. We have eternal value because of the eternal King who saved us. We're going to explore that in great detail across the series. We're not going to just kick back and say, vanity of vanity is life. We're finding out all the things in the world are baseless. And that's why for the rest of this book, we're going to keep looking at this comparison of the world and, and, and the eternal things, the, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of men. We're going to keep contrasting these as we go, and we're going to see with greater clarity how futile it is in this world and how many great things we can do for the kingdom of God as we invest in those eternal things. We're going to explore that in great detail. So as, as just a quick action step, as this is an introduction, it's not a big thing yet. We haven't dug in too much. I hope you got some great knowledge, some, some motivation. But let me give this action step to you today. Who are you going to share this hope with this week? If I asked you to, I bet it would take you probably less than five minutes to write down five names of people who you know need some kind of hope or encouragement today. Five people who are hopeless right now. Can I encourage you, whoever those five people are, if it's one person, if it's ten people, connect with them this week. Let that be your accountability. I want you to feel guilty by the end of the week if you haven't done it. In, in a righteous, I'm encouraging you to do this. Reach out and share that hope with the person that came to mind when I said, who could you share that hope with? Who could we bring hope of Christ? Who could we share something? Hey, things are bad here, but look what's coming in the eternal kingdom. Hey, the Christian has great hope after this world, after this life. And while we walk through here, there are futile things, but they are not meaningless to us. They can glorify God just as we were created to do. So I encourage you to do that. Connect with people this week. And may his work and the joy he provides manifest itself in our lives. 
as we think about these things, then we take all the more joy as we focus our things on heaven. Just like Colossians says, keep our minds set next to Christ where he is, seated at the right hand of the Father. Let's, let's share that with people. Let's be reminded this week ourselves. Let's talk to our family. Let's talk to our friends and remind them that life is not meaningless. In fact, it is meaningful. Not just meaningful, it's full of meaning when we go after the eternal things of God. So can I just end with this today, church? This is the charge to remind you with just the greatest love and care from all your pastors here at Anchor Church. There's one, you matter. Two, you are loved. But three, you are responsible to share that. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we are grateful today to have seen with just such clear detail, Father, how the world you've created is so great and so good and has so many things in it when we focus on you as humans, we chase the wrong things and we invest in the wrong stuff. Lord, may your Holy Spirit, through your word, teach us today may it, and solidify these things we've heard in our hearts, Lord. Lord, please remind us that we ought to always give all our efforts towards you and your kingdom. Of course, we take care of our daily lives and the needs that you've given us here, that they have purpose in <clears throat> our, our walking before you as faithful people. But Lord, may we never chase the pursuits of this world. May we never chase the pleasures of this world, the, the lusts, the feelings, the drugs, the possessions, the power, the things that go along with the world here. May, Lord, we humble ourselves before you. May we seek the kingdom of God first and foremost. And, Lord, may we take this as a great encouragement of knowing that our life is the exact opposite of futile. It is full of meaning because we were created to glorify the King of kings forever. Lord, we love you, we praise you, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks so much for being with us today here at church. You know, I hope this message really got a hold of you because I tell you, it, it really grabbed me to have read and to study through these things and see the futility of this world and the power of God. So you, I tell you, if you had a good insight on that, would you share that with us? Would you send us an email or would you put a comment there in the text, if, uh, the, the chat box there? If you have a prayer request, if you want to be able to give, if you want to connect with us in any way, you can always jump in there or of course you can go to anchorchurch.com slash whatever your campus is and we would love to connect with you that way. But church, let me just again encourage you this week. You matter. You are loved and you are responsible to share that great truth that we are not meaningless. We are meaningful. Walk in that with great confidence this week. Your Father goes with you. We love you, church. I can't wait to see you next week. See you then.